Hello, welcome to this new video of Math S400, Mathematics and Economic Modeling. Uh, in today's video, we're going to see an important result in mathematics, it's called Burgess Maximization Theorem. And in order to prove this theorem, we're going to use several uh, things and results that we have seen before. Okay, so this is uh, more or less a culmination of everything uh, that we have been working uh, towards. Okay, so let me go to the whiteboard. So let me first uh, motivate uh, what we're going to do in uh, this lecture. So remember, previous lecture we have seen the budget set. So for a given price and a given level of income, the budget set are all the quantities Q and RK plus right non-negative uh, bundles such that P times Q, the inner product of P and Q, is less or equal to M. Okay, so this is uh, all the feasible bundle that I can buy with a given price and a given level of income. And then you say, what is the rational consumer going to do? Well, he's going to find the Q, okay, in this set uh, to maximize his utility function. Okay, so this is the standard consumer maximization problem. You're going to choose the Q that maximizes utility and then subject to uh, Q being in the set. Okay. Q in the set of all possible bundles that this uh, consumer can buy. So for a given price and a given level of income, we can form the set, we can make this maximization problem and we can uh, find the solution to this maximization problem. Okay, so uh, the maximum value here will simply give you a number. Okay, so you, you find an optimal bundle, you plug it into the utility function and what comes out of this maximization problem is simply a number. Right, so let's call this number V. So if I change prices and or income, I will have a different budget set, I will have a different maximization problem, so it's possible that I get a different number V. Okay, so uh, in short, for any vector of prices M, uh, vector of prices P and every level of income M, I can make this maximization problem, and what comes out of this maximization problem will be simply a number reflecting the maximum utility that I can get given this uh, budget set. Okay, so Whatever comes out of this maximization problem, uh, let me call this the V, will depend in general on prices and income, right? For different prices and different income, it's possible that I get a different number. So you can write this as a function of P and M, okay? So this VPM is the maximum utility that I can get um, by choosing Q in the budget set with prices P and income M. Okay, so this is basically the definition of VPM. And we know that this number always exists as long as uh, this set is compact, which you have so shown in the previous section, and as long as this is continuous. Okay, so maximizing continuous utility function subject to a compact set, uh, we'll give you a solution, and then the solution will be this. Okay, so V will be a function, so we can take any P in RK++, we can take any income in R++, and it will produce a real number, all right? So this function here, that gives the optimal solution for every input, this is called the optimal value function. For this particular problem here, the optimal value function, maybe you already also know it, this is called the indirect, uh, indirect utility function. Okay, but in general, for more general problems, it's simply called the optimal value function. Okay, so for this particular problem, what you put inside the function is called the parameters of the problem, right? So P here, P and M. 
these are called the parameters and then the Q that you're looking for this is a variable right so once you solve this problem Q will no, no longer be in uh, in the solution right so what you get is a function of only the parameters okay so we can make this uh, particular problem a bit more general Okay, so we can apply it to, to many more problems than only utility maximization. So in general, what you have, uh, you can call theta uh, a vector. Okay, I will make it a vector. So this is a vector of parameters. Okay, so for this particular problem, the theta was equal to Pn. Okay. basically a stacked vector of prices and uh, income okay and then what we do uh, we have some correspondence right b is a correspondence of the parameters so let me call this correspondence g of theta and this gives you all the possible uh, value values that the decision variable can take okay so g of theta is uh, let me call the decision variable x So it's all the x's that are feasible. Okay. Feasible means that uh, they're available uh, in problem. Okay. And then finally, what we need to do? Well, we have to maximize something, right? So we maximize uh, with respect to x. What we maximize? We maximize a function f of x. And here we're also going to allow the function f to depend on the parameter uh, theta. Okay, so here this is a bit more general or less here because here the utility function in general doesn't depend on prices and income. But for the more general uh, problem, we're going to allow the thing we're maximizing, right, also to depend on uh, the parameters theta in this problem. Okay, so what we're we going to do, we're going to maximize a function that may depend on the decision variables, but also the parameters theta we're going to maximize it with respect to x subject to the constraint that x is in this correspondence uh, of theta okay okay so this is uh, our maximization problem and let's assume that for every theta right this uh, for example this uh, correspondence here is compact right this set is compact so and f is continuous so we can always solve this uh, maximization problem right so if i uh, if f is a real value function right we'll go into details in uh, a minute but what you get out of this maximization problem will be similar to here will be a, a value right it will be a number okay so we can say that this is a will be a value and for different values of theta what you will get out of it are different numbers right so here the value function will be a function of theta similar as here the indirect utility function is a function of prices and income here it will be the value of theta so for different values of theta you will get uh, different numbers so this will be the optimal value function okay so if you go back to the utility maximization problem what we could do is that for every price and income we can look at all the queues that solve this problem Okay. In some cases, there will be only one queue that solves the problem that gives you the highest utility. In other cases, there will be multiple queues that solve the problem. All right. So what you can do is you can look at all the queues uh, in the budget set. Okay. Such that. Um, satisfies the property that the utility of q is equal to the maximum utility that you can get okay so basically what's in this set these are all the queues and that are feasible and that produces the maximum utility that you can get from this maximization problem right so basically it's all the queues that solve your maximization problem and you see that this is simply a subset of bpm so for every price and income you will have a different set here okay 
So in general, this is a correspondence that will depend on P and M. Okay, so correspondence because it, there can be more than one Q that satisfy this uh, property, right? And all these Qs that satisfy this property, you put this in a set and you call this uh, gamma. And gamma is called, so this is called the optimal value function V, gamma is called the optimal solution correspondence. Okay, and in particular for the utility for the utility maximization problem, this is also known as the amount correspondence. Okay, in some cases you will have the demand function. You will see this, uh, in, I think, in the next lecture. But here, this is in general a correspondence. There can be multiple queues that solve the problem, so we call this a, a demand correspondence. Similar here for this more general problem, we can um, construct the correspondence gamma of theta, which are all the axes in G of theta such that f of x theta is equal to v of theta. <clears throat> so all the decision variables such that if I plug in x here into the objective function, I get the maximum value that I can get. So this is here called the uh, solution correspondence. Okay, so this is the uh, general setup. So let's recap. So what do we have? We have uh, decision variables x that are in some domain x and this for example is, is a set of vectors so we can uh, this is a subset of rk and then we have parameters uh, that are in some set uh, theta right this is capital theta which can be some set subset of uh, r l let's say right so these uh, may be of different dimensions and then we have a function f that takes an element decision variable and it takes a, a parameter theta and it gives you a number r right this is the function that you would like to maximize and then you have a correspondence g that takes a parameter value in theta and gives you a subset of uh, possible decision variables that you can take right so this latter one is a, is a correspondence and what we do, we look at the, we'd like to maximize with respect to x, fx theta, subject to x being an element of g theta. All right, so this is a maximization problem uh, that you would like to solve. If we can solve this maximization problem, right, there are some conditions that we have to impose on this. But if we can solve it, then what we get out of this is a number. And then this number is called v theta because for different thetas we will get uh, different numbers. This is the optimal value function. And then if for a given theta we look at all the x's that solve this maximization problem, we get a subset of x's and this is called the uh, solution correspondence uh, gamma of theta. Okay, so if you look at the domain, v will take parameter theta and will give you a number, right? And gamma will take a parameter theta and will produce a, a subset of uh, decision variables x. Okay, so this is, a, this is the structure of the problem that we're going to look at. And now we're going to state, and then we're also going to prove uh, the main result of this lecture. This is called Burgess maximization, maximization theorem. Okay, so we're looking at this problem. So define all these sets here and these correspondences here. 
So what does this Berger's maximization theorem say? Well, if you have this kind of structure, and then if f is continuous, and g is continuous, and this is a correspondence, so what does it mean for a correspondence to be continuous? Well, it means that it's upper hemicontinuous and lower hemicontinuous, right? So it satisfies both hemicontinuity properties. Well, well, if these two things are true, then we have that V, right, which is the solution correspondence, is continuous. Okay, that's the first thing that follows from the theorem. And the second thing is that this uh, solution correspondence gamma is upper heme continuous. Okay, so this is Berger's maximization problem. If you have a maximization problem of this kind, then if f is continuous and g is continuous in the sense of its upper and lower heme continuous, then this function v, optimal value function, will be continuous and the solution correspondence will be upper heme continuous. So let's start with the proof of this theorem. So first we're going to show you that V is continuous. Okay, so remember in order to show that a function is continuous, what we need to show is that for all sequences, so V is a function of uh, thetas, right? So for all sequences, theta n, if uh, in the domain, if theta n converges to some theta, then v of theta n converges to v of theta. Right. So this is the thing we need to show: continuity of the function v. So. In the section or in the lecture on continuous functions, we have seen an equivalent to definition of continuity. And this is uh, actually the definition of continuity that we're going to uh, show. So we have seen that this is equivalent to the fact that for all sequences, theta n and theta, there exist <coughs> No, sorry, for all sequences theta n and theta that converge to theta, there exists a subsequence of the sequence called the theta phi n that satisfies the following property that V of theta phi n converges to V of theta. Okay, so we have seen that continuity of a function only need to be established along subsequences. Well, this is the definition for every sequence that converges to theta. We can find this. It's sufficient that we can find the subsequence to, such that v of the, along the subsequence converges to v of theta. Okay, and it's this last here that we're going to demonstrate, right? If you have shown this, then you have shown that v is continuous. Okay, so in order to show this, we take a sequence that converges to theta, and then we have to construct a subsequence such that v of the subsequence converges to v of theta. Okay, so take any sequence t n and theta such that t n converges to to theta. Okay. So if theta n, theta n is in theta, okay, what we can do is we can look at the following problem. We can maximize with respect to x, f x theta n, such that x is in g of theta n. Okay, so this is the, this maximization problem here <coughs> for the particular value where theta is equal to theta n. Okay, 
Now, g of theta n is a compact set. Okay, so how can you see this? You take any sequence in this compact set, right? And then by upper Hemi continuity, uh, this sequence has to be bounded. Okay, that's the first one. And if it converges, then the limit also has to be in the sequence. Okay, so by upper Hemi continuity, you know that this is compact for fixed theta n. Next, we know that f is continuous. Okay, so we're maximizing a continuous function subject to a, a compact domain. So we know that this maximization problem uh, can be solved, right? So we know that there's a v of theta n uh, that solves this problem. Okay. Similarly, if this solution can be solved, you can also look at the solution correspondence, which is gamma theta of n. Okay, and because this maximization problem uh, can be solved, we know that gamma of theta of n will not be equal to the empty set. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to take an xn and gamma of theta. Okay, so for every theta n, we can make this maximization problem. We can solve it. We get an optimal value function. We get the solution correspondence, which will be non-empty. So we can take an element out of the solution correspondence. Okay, so in practice, what we have now so far is we have a sequence of thetas, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and so on. Theta n. This sequence converges to theta. Okay, for every theta, we can solve this maximization problem. We get v of theta 1, v of theta 2, v of theta 3, and so on, v of theta n. Okay. Also, for any uh, theta n, you can take an element out of the solutions uh, correspondence. Okay, so here we can take an element x1, here we can take an element x2, here we can take an element x3, and so on, xn, uh, forever. And this here is an element in the solution correspondence, so remember what the solution correspondence is. Well, it's all the elements in g of theta n, right, they are feasible, and f of xn theta n is equal to v of theta n. Okay, so these are all the uh, x's that solve my problem. So what do we know? We know that uh, x1 is in g of theta 1, x2 is in g of theta 2, x3 is in g of theta 3, and so on. In general, xn is in g of theta n and so on. And you know that v of theta 1 is equal to f of x1 theta 1. This is equal to f of x2 theta 2. This is equal to f of x3 theta 3 and so on. In general, v of theta n will be equal to f of xn theta n and so on. Okay, so basically uh, we solved the problem for all the thetas. We have found optimal values, right? We have found solutions. We know that f of the solution is equal to the optimal value. This is by definition of gamma, right? This is how we define this. And you also know that every x from the solution is in g. Okay. Okay, good. So what does this tell us? Well, first of all, the sequence of thetas converges to theta, right? Theta n converges to theta. Also, for all n, x of n is in g of theta n. Okay, so for all n, x n is in g of theta n. Then you can use upper Hemi continuity of correspondence g. Okay, and this tells me that the sequence of xn's
is bounded. Okay. We have a bounded sequence. So by the bolzano weierstrass theorem, we know that this has a uh, convergent subsequence. Okay, so there exists a x phi n that converges. So for example, x phi n converges to some vector x. Now what we can do is that for this subsequence, for x1, so for x1 we had the theta1, for x2 we had the theta2, for x3 we had the theta3, and so on and so on. So for x phi n we have a theta phi n, right? Just look at the corresponding theta along the subsequence. Okay, so we have theta phi n's. The sequence of thetas converges to uh, this theta here. So if you take a subsequence, it has to converge to the same limit. So this will converge to theta. So what do we have? We have a sequence of thetas converging to theta. We have a sequence of x's converging to x. And for all n, x phi n is in G of theta phi n. Okay. So similar to here, but now we still also have convergence of the sequence, we can use, let me put it here, we can use upper Hemi continuity, upper Hemi continuity of G again. All right, so applying the definition of upper Hemi continuity again, but then now along the subsequences, what do we have? We have that X is in G of the limiting theta, which is theta, okay? So this entire thing to show that there is a subsequence of x's that converges to x, and this limit here is in uh, g of theta. Okay, so let's uh, recap what we have done. We have a sequence of thetas corresponding x's, uh, corresponding values of the value functions. Right, they are equal to these ones, and then every x is in uh, the corresponding g. And then we made use of upper Hemi continuity of g twice. First of all, to show that the sequence of x's has a convergent subsequence, and then show again that the limit of this convergent subsequence is in the limit of g theta. Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, subsequence here. Okay, so the first element is g phi 1. Uh, theta phi 1, theta phi 2, and so on, until theta phi n at infinity, and this sequence here converges to, to theta. Okay. We had a corresponding sequence x phi 1, x phi 2, in general x phi n, and now we know that this subsequence here converges to x. Okay, so from this here. Okay, I know that x phi 1 is in g of theta phi 1, x phi 2 is in g of theta phi 2, and so on. So in general, this is in g of theta phi n. And you know that this is why we used upper Hemi continuity twice. X is in G of theta. Okay. Okay. And then every time we had an optimal value function, V of theta phi one, V of theta phi two, and so on, V of theta phi n. Okay and then corresponding f of x theta 1, uh, x phi 1, theta phi 1, uh, and these two are equal, right? This is equal to f of x theta phi 2, uh, x phi 2, theta phi 2. In general, v of theta phi n will be equal to f of x phi n, theta phi n, okay, a lot of notation. So what can we derive from this? So the thetas converge to theta, the x's converge to x, so this here will converge 
converge because fs continues, right? And the x's converge, the x phi ends converge to x, the theta phi ends converge to theta. So because of continuity, this will converge to f of x theta. Okay. So here we have the sequence of numbers. Every sequence is equal to this, right? This sequence converges. So this means that this sequence also has to converge. What? Because these sequences are identical, they have to converge to the same number, right? Okay. So in order to understand what's going on, let's go back to what we wanted to show, right? So we wanted to show, we started with the sequence theta n going to theta. We wanted to show that there exists a subsequence such that v of theta phi n converges to v of theta. Okay, so so far we have constructed a subsequence theta of phi n's, and we have shown that v of theta phi n's converges to f of x theta. Okay, so in order to prove this, what we need to show is that f of x theta is equal to v of theta. Okay, the limit of this subsequence is equal to uh, v of theta. And once we have shown this, then uh, the proof is finished. So let's have a look at this here. What's v of theta? Well, v of theta is the maximum x of f. Let me not, not call it x, right? Because I already have an x here. Let me call it y, right? So I'm choosing the y that maximizes f y theta subject to y being in g of theta. Okay. And we need to show that this is equal to fx of uh, theta. So we're going to prove this by contradiction. So assume fx theta is different from v of theta. Okay. So if fx of theta is different from v of theta, well, v of theta is the maximum, right? Subject to y is in g of theta. So we know that x is in g of theta. Why do we know this? Well, because here we have shown it here, right? This is why we use this upper hemicontinuity twice in order to show that x is in g of theta. So x is in g of theta, so which means that x satisfies the restriction here, right? So it's a feasible value. X is feasible. So we, we call a variable feasible if it satisfies the restrictions of the optimization problem, right? So here X satisfies the restrictions because it's in G of theta. But if I plug it into the optimal value function, I get this, which is not equal to the maximum thing, okay? So if the two are different, then it has to be the case that Fx of theta is strictly below v of theta. Okay? That's just because x is feasible. It's, if I plug it in, into the optimal value function, I don't get the maximal, maximum, right? So it has to be strictly below. Okay, so this is the first thing uh, that we have found. So if x, fx theta is smaller, right? Then you know that x is not in gamma of theta, right? So it cannot provide a solution to the maximization problem, right? Because the optimal value function is uh, strictly below. So let us take a y in gamma of theta, right? So a y that solves this maximization problem. Well, then we know that fx theta is strictly below f y theta. Okay. So what have you done? If you assume that these two things are different, then we can solve this maximization problem and you will get a solution that's different from x and in particular the optimal value function or the value function of this uh, solution will be strictly higher than the value function of this x. Okay, so be because we assume that y was the optimal, was an optimal solution, we also know that y is in g of theta. Okay.
So let's go back here. We had the sequence of theta phi n's converging to theta. So let's recall call it here. So theta phi n converging to theta. And we have that y is in the limit in g, right? Is in g of theta where this is, uh, this, uh, theta. And now we're going to use lower hemicontinuity. Okay, so we already used upper hemicontinuity of G. This is a step where we're going to use lower hemicontinuity. So remember, if you have a sequence converging to theta, if Y is in the limiting, then I know that there is, exists a sequence of Y's, right? There exists a sequence Y phi N. Okay, such that for all N, Y phi N, for all n greater or equal to some n, okay, y phi n is in g of theta phi n, okay, and y phi n converges to y. Okay, so this is by the definition of lower heme continuity. You can find the sequence of y's corresponding to these phi's, all right, so for every theta phi n, we have a corresponding sequence of y's, y phi 1, y phi 2, 1, y phi n, right, this is in g of theta phi 1, this is in g of uh, theta phi 2, and so on, and this y's converge to y. Okay, so this is basically uh, what we have, and this follows from lower hemicontinuity of the correspondence uh, G. Okay, so we're almost there. So let me write the sequence once more. We have theta phi 1, theta phi 2, theta phi n. This course converges to theta. We have y phi 1, y phi 2, y phi n, this converges to uh, y. So we can plug this into the function f, right, so f theta phi 1, no, oh, y phi 1, theta phi 1, uh, if y phi 2, theta phi 2, here we have uh, f y phi n, theta phi n, okay, sorry for the sloppy notation. Okay, and we know that the thetas converge to theta, the y's converge to y, so this will converge to f y theta. Okay, remember, uh, we also had the corresponding sequence of x's. So we have an x phi 1. In general, x phi n, right, and this converges to the vector x. And remember how we picked these uh, x's. So if I find my uh, page again, all right. So for every theta n, we made this optimization problem, and then we took an x n n the solution correspondence. Okay, so this is how we pick the axis, right? So this is in gamma theta phi 1, this is in gamma theta phi 2, this is in gamma theta phi n, and so on. Okay. So if I take this x and this theta and I plug it in into my objective function, I get uh, f of x phi 1 theta 
phi 1, right? But I know that x at z in the solution correspondence, so this is equal to v of theta phi 1, okay? Here, if I plug it in, I get f x phi 2 theta phi 2, but I know because x phi 2 is in the solution correspondence here, I know this is equal to v of theta phi 2. So in general, this is an f of x phi n theta phi n, and know that this is equal to v of theta uh, phi n. Okay, so we watched this before. And we know that both of these uh, converge to f of x theta. Okay, and we have seen that this is equal to v of theta. This was by assumption. Okay. So here, for this problem, for all these y's at so from some point onwards, right? For all n greater or equal to m, I know that all these y's are feasible, right? So they're in the feasible set of options that I can pick for my maximization problem. And I also know that x is optimal, right? So if y is feasible, then whatever I plug into f that is feasible will be lower or equal to what's optimal, right? This, this uh, is just by definition of the problem. Okay, so here y, y was a feasible solution, x was an optimal solution, so the value function at x should be greater or equal to the function value at y. Here I have the same thing. For third one I have the same thing. And here in general I have the same thing. Okay. Um, there's a small catch that this only has to hold for n uh, greater or equal to n. Right. So we ignore all the inequalities so far. And then we have greater or equal at some at, uh, from some point onwards. So what do we have here? Here we have a sequence of numbers, right? All these are in R. Here we have a sequence of numbers, all these are in R. And every element of the second sequence is greater or equal to the element of the first sequence. Okay, so if you take the limit of this sequence, we get this. If you take the limit of the sequence, we get this. So because inequalities are kept in the limit, you have that f of x theta is greater or equal to v of theta. And then I have to look uh, at my previous page, if I can find it again. All right, it's here. Remember, we have assumed that by contradiction that f of x theta was low, lower than v of theta. And here we have shown that f of x theta is greater or equal to v of theta. So this gives a desired contradiction, okay? So maybe it's important uh, to go back to the theorem and go over it again. Okay, so what do we wanted to show? We wanted to show that for any sequence of thetas, if it converges to theta, then I can find a subsequence such that v along the subsequence converges to v of theta. So we have started with an arbitrary sequence of thetas that converges. Okay, then for every element in the sequence, you have made this optimization problem. All right, so we have uh, shown that we can make this optimization problem, right? The set is compact, this is continuous, so it has a solution. So for every one of these optimization problems, we have taken one of the solutions, All right? This gives you a value f x1 v uh, theta1, that's x equal to v of theta 1 and so on, right? So what do we have? We have a sequence of thetas that converge to theta. For every theta, we have a corresponding x in the solution because g is upper values. We can extract a convergent subsequence, right? So we have convergent subsequence. We have a converging sequence of thetas that converge to theta. Every x, y, n is in this, the correspondence, the feasible correspondence. So now using upper Hemi continuity again, we know that this sequence here of x's has to converge to uh, some x 
no, this is not true. It's only along the subsequence, right? So along the subsequence converges to x. Now x has to be in g of t. So then, if you restrict this sub, this sequence of details along the subsequence, right? So we only need to show convergence along the subsequence. So this is uh, justified, right? You have a corresponding subsequence of x's that now converge to x, uh, and by upper Hemic continuity, this x is in the uh, correspondence g of theta. Okay. Every x. If I combine the x with the theta and plug it into, into the objective function, I get the sequence of f's. This sequence equals the sequence of v's, right? Because every x is optimal for the given theta. So because the thetas converge to theta, the x's converge to x, f is continuous, I know that the sequence of f's converge to f of x of theta. So the only thing that we are left to show is that this limiting value here is equal to the optimal value at uh, theta. And we prove this by contradiction. So basically what do we do is we assume that there exists, it's not equal to the optimal value, then it has to be strictly less. So if it's strictly less, then we can find something in the solution correspondence that solves the problem, right? So we call this the y. So we have a sequence of theta that converts to theta. We have y in the limiting g. And now we use lower hemicontinuity to construct a, sub, a sequence of y's that converge to the y, and every y is in the correspondence g of the theta. Okay. So for every one of these y's, we can plug it in, into the objective function, and we know that this value will be less or equal to the optimal value, right? Because the y is feasible, but the x was optimal. Okay. So because the y's converge to y, the thetas converge to theta, this converges to fy of theta, which was assumed to be the optimal value. The sequence of v's we already know converges to fx of theta by the uh, previous part. And because every one of these is greater or equal to uh, these, we have a sequence of elements. Each one is greater than the sequence of elements here. So the limiting value has to be greater or equal to the limiting value here. And this gives you the contradiction. So the second part of the theorem requires to show that the gamma, the solution correspondence, is upper hemicontinuous, right? So remember gamma of theta, this was simply all the x's that are feasible, right? So a g of theta, such that fx of x, fx theta will be, was equal to the optimal value, d theta. Okay, so we need to show that this is upper hemicontinuity, continuous, so we need to show two properties. So if you take a sequence theta n is going to theta, right? And for all n, I take an x n and gamma of theta n. And I have to show that this sequence is bounded. Okay, so let's first uh, show this, right? This is what we need to show. Now if x n is in gamma of theta n, right so it's in this set then i know it's also in g of uh, theta n okay so from this it follows that for all n x n is in g of theta n okay this is simply because gamma is a subset of g and then because of these two things here and because g is upper hemicontinuous we immediately get that x n Is bounded. Okay, so here the proof is uh, quite easy because the g is bounded, right? The gamma is also bounded because it's a subset of the of the g's. Okay, so this is from the first part of uh, upper hemicontinuity, and then for the second part we have to show that if you have a sequence theta n converging to theta, and then for all n, x n is in g, is in gamma. Sorry, gamma of theta n, and if the x n's converge to some x, well, then I need to show that x is in gamma of the limiting uh, theta, right? This is what we need to show. So for all n, x n, x n is in uh, gamma of theta n. So what happens if I, looking at the definition of gamma theta n, 
I know that this has to hold for this particular theta n. Okay, so from this I know that f x n theta n is equal to v of theta. So the x n's converge to x, the theta n's converge to theta. So I know by f is continuous, I know that this converges to f of x theta. Okay? Uh, that's uh, for sure. The theta n's go to theta. So now I use the fact that v is continuous. So how do I know that v is continuous? Well, we have proven it uh, just before, right? This entire thing of taking subsequences and so on was just to show that v is continuous. Well, now that v is continuous, we can use the definition of continuity. So if theta n converge to theta, then v of theta n has to converge to v of theta. Okay, so in the limit, I know that f of x theta is equal, in, equal to v of theta. That's the first thing that I know. The second thing that I know is if x is in gamma, then it has to be in g. So for all n, x is in g of theta n. So I have a sequence theta n is going to theta. For all n, x n is in g of theta n, and x n converge to x. Well, then I can use upper Hemi continuity of g to show that x is in g of theta. Okay, so what do we have? We have that x is in g of theta. We have that f of x theta is in is equal to v of theta. So if I look at the definition of gamma, x is in g of theta, f of x theta is equal to v of theta. So from this it follows that x is in gamma of theta, which is exactly what I needed to show. All right, so this shows that indeed the correspondence gamma is uh, upper hemicontinuous. <sighs> okay, let's take a small break. Okay, let's have a look at this example. So the parameter uh, theta is a real number and we want to maximize theta times x is one minus theta times one minus x. And we would, x is a decision variable, right? Subject to the constraint that x is in uh, zero one. Okay, so let's look at the different elements here. Uh, for example, fx theta, right? This is your objective function. Here, this is equal to theta times x plus one minus theta times one minus x. Okay, and I hope you see that this is clearly a continuous function of x and theta. Okay, it's so addition, multiplication, and so on. So this uh, is okay. So what's the g of theta? Well, it's all the possible values that x can take when uh, for this particular value. Well, this is simply equal to zero, one. Okay, so if I draw theta here, then for a particular theta, the values that uh, x can take is between zero and one. So basically it's this unit interval. For different theta, it's the same thing, right? So it's all the same thing, so this is my g of uh, theta, this is my correspondence. Okay, and I hope you see that this is upper and lower heme continuous, right? So for any theta here, I can approximate it to the right, to the left. If I take a value, I can always find a sequence that approximates it, right? So this is a uh, upper heme continuous and lower heme continuous. Okay, so we have maximizing the continuous objective function subject to a continuous constraint. So we know that this has a value function v of theta that's uh, continuous and then the solution correspondence uh, gamma of theta has to be upper hemi continuous okay so this is divergence maximization uh, theorem 
So let's have a look at uh, the solutions of this problem. This is simple enough such that we can actually uh, compute the optimal solution and the optimal value function. Okay, so here we have theta times x plus 1 minus theta times 1 minus x. So if we increase x by a little bit, right, so it will increase by the value theta and decrease by the value 1 minus theta. Okay, and if we decrease x by a little bit, the value function will increase by value 1 minus theta and decrease by value of theta. Okay, so when will it be worthwhile to make x bigger? Uh, make x bigger is uh, good if the increase theta will be bigger than the decrease 1 minus theta. If theta is bigger than 1 minus theta, okay, or if uh, theta is bigger than one half, okay. So make x smaller is good if the reverse holds, right? If theta is smaller than one minus theta, or theta uh, is smaller than one half. All right. So this this is a scratch paper, right? This is uh, just to get the intuition going on. Uh, what could be the optimal value, all right? So we see that for theta, one half is like a break point, right? So if theta is bigger than one half, increasing x is good, right? It's going to increase the objective function, but x is between zero and one, right? So we would like to make x as big as possible in this case. However, x has to be between zero and one, so the optimal thing to do here will be equal to set x equal to one. Okay, so if theta is bigger than one half. So this is uh, going to be optimal. If theta is smaller than one half, we would like to make x smaller. So in particular, we would like to make x as small as possible, right? But x is between zero and one. So making x as small as possible, you're going to set x equal to zero if theta is smaller than one half, okay? And then, of course, we have to look at the value when x is theta is equal to one half. What's going to be the objective function? Well, let's look at our uh, scrap paper. So if theta is equal to one half, right, this is the case that we haven't considered yet. Um, then here we have one half times x. And here we have uh, one half times one minus x. So we see that the one halves cancel out and we get a value function of one half, right? So this will be independent of the value of x. So if you look at all the values of x that are optimal when theta is one half, it doesn't matter what, what I put in here, right? All of them will give you the same uh, value. So if theta is equal to one half, then any value of x between zero and one is going to uh, be optimal. Okay, so in this case, let's look at the solution correspondence. Okay, so if theta is bigger than one half, right, then I'm going to put x equal to one. So this is going to be equal to the number one, right? So this is the only value that is going to be optimal. If theta is equal to one half, then any value between zero and one will give you the same objective function one half. So here, solution correspondence is going to be uh, 0, 1. And if theta is smaller than 1 half, it's going to be optimal to put x equal to 0. So the solution correspondence is equal, is a set containing the number 0. Okay. So given this, what's now the optimal value function? Okay, so this is going to be equal to theta times x plus 1 minus theta times 1 minus x, okay, so v of theta, if theta is bigger than 1 half, what do we get? Well, x will be equal to 1, so here we have theta, uh, and this will be 0, so here the optimal value function will be theta. Okay, if theta is equal to 1 half, well, we already calculated what's going to be the value, right, it's going to be 1 half. And if theta is smaller than one half, 
well x is going to be equal to 0 so the first term drops out this is going to be equal to 1 so I get 1 minus theta okay so let's draw this uh, function here right so this is theta here we have 0 so for theta bigger than 1 half P of theta is going to be equal to theta. Okay, so we have here one half, one half. Uh, this should be the same distance, right? But I'm drawing very badly here. So if theta is bigger than one half, so this is in the region uh, to the right here, we're going to get something like this. Okay. If theta is equal to one half, then we have the point one half, which is equal to this. And if theta is smaller than 1 half, then we have the function 1 minus theta. So if theta is equal to 0, we're hitting 1. If theta is equal to 1 half, we're hitting 1 half. So this is going to be uh, this function here. So this is going to be my v theta function. And you see that this is a continuous function, right? which was exactly what we needed here. Right? v of theta has to be continuous. If you draw this and you find something that's not continuous, then you have uh, made a mistake somewhere. Okay, so this is our optimal value function. Let's now draw the solution correspondence. Okay, so again we have, let me put it here so we can all see it. All right, so we have the cutoff one half, we have zero. So for theta bigger than one half, gamma of theta is equal to one. So if you have one here, all right? So for theta bigger than one half, this is everything to the right. We have this correspondence here will be only contain the value of one. Theta smaller than one half, it will only contain, so let me draw it in green. Okay, I don't know if you can see this on the video, but this is a straight line equal to one. If it's lower than one half, then it will be equal to zero. So we get this. And for theta equal to one half, you get the entire interval zero one. So this will be my uh, gamma here. Okay, so it's like a jump uh, like this. So this is my gamma of theta. Something like this. All right. So you see that this is another not a continuous function, right? It's a, it has a jump here, but this is upper hemicontinuous. And you can easily also see that it's not lower hemicontinuous, right? So for example, if I take, uh, so this is not lower hemicontinuous uh, theta equal to one half, right? So for example, at one half, I can take this point here, then I can take a sequence that goes to one half. I can take a point in the limiting uh, gamma, but the sequence will not converge to this point, right? Because it has to take a jump here, which is uh, not possible for it to converge. Okay, so this is upper hemicontinuous, as we require from Berger's maximization theorem, but not lower hemicontinuous. Okay, so the solution correspondence does not need to be lower hemicontinuous. Berger's maximization theorem only requires it to be upper hemicontinuous.